Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Kelly Gissendainer? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll go through the background of Kelly Gissendainer. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Kelly Gissendainer was born in Lawrenceville, Georgia on March 8, 1968. She grew up on a farm with her parents, Larry and Maxine, as well as six brothers and two sisters. The children were often forced to pick cotton, which is what their parents did for a living. Larry drank excessive quantities of alcohol. Larry and Maxine regularly were involved in fights due to alcohol consumption. Maxine had an affair when Kelly was three years old. Maxine divorced Larry and married her lover just eight days after the divorce was final. The new husband's name was Billy. He was even more violent than Larry. Kelly would often hide as Maxine and Billy would fight. Reportedly, Maxine and Billy often threatened to kill each other and, on a few occasions, attempted to kill each other. Kelly was beaten by both Maxine and Billy and had a number of other traumatic experiences that I'll talk about in the analysis. Just two weeks after graduating high school in 1986, Kelly had a son, but she did not know who the father was. In 1987, Kelly married. That marriage would only last six months. Kelly was arrested for shoplifting. She received one year of probation after pleading guilty. She worked at various jobs after this, including a hotel. Her co-workers found her to be incredibly immature. In 1989, she married again, this time to a man named Douglas Gissendainer, who went by the name Doug. Kelly and Doug had a daughter in 1990. The couple moved in with Kelly's mother after they both lost their jobs. Doug enlisted in the Army and was sent to Germany. Kelly enlisted in the Army not long after this. Their marriage soon fell apart. They would separate in 1992 and divorce in 1993. Kelly started a romantic relationship with another man and became pregnant. She did this because she wanted to get out of the army, and she believed if she became pregnant, that would happen. She was correct. The army discharged her. Not long after this, she would have another son. The child's father died from cancer at age 26. Doug and Kelly reunited at some point, and they remarried in 1995. They separated about five months later, but would get back together again. Doug became the stepfather of Kelly's two sons. The couple would purchase a home in Auburn, Georgia in 1996, just before Christmas. The town of Auburn has about 7,000 residents. Kelly started having an affair with a man named Gregory Bruce Owen, who went by Greg. He was about four years younger than Kelly, having been born in March of 1971. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On February 7, 1997, Greg hid near the residence of Doug and Kelly and waited for Doug to arrive home. Here's what happened, according to Greg. After Doug arrived, Greg produced a knife and threatened Doug. Greg told Doug to get into Doug's vehicle, a 1994 Chevrolet Caprice, and drive to a remote wooded area. When they stopped, Greg told Doug to get out of the vehicle and start walking. After walking a short distance, Greg then told Doug to get on his knees, which he did. Greg took a nightstick and struck Doug in the head, knocking him to the ground, before using the knife to stab him in the back and neck. Kelly arrived soon after the attack, and Kelly and Gregory hid Doug's body in the woods and then set his car on fire using kerosene. On February 8, Kelly woke up in her residence and pretended she didn't know why Doug had not come home. She called various friends and family members and asked them if they knew where Doug was. On February 9, the police found Doug's burned-out Chevrolet Caprice. Kelly's story to investigators was that her marriage with Doug was in good shape. The couple had been to a birthday party on February 7, and they left from that party separately. She arrived home and intended to take medication for pain. She had endometriosis, but she accidentally took a tranquilizer. She woke up hours later only to realize that Doug was not in bed with her. The media started covering the case. Kelly was interviewed. She was crying on air, 
saying that she wanted Doug to walk back in the door. Kelly kept emphasizing how out of the ordinary the situation was. She thought something bad must have happened to Doug. She suggested that Doug had such a good nature, somebody probably took advantage of him. She then jumped right to the theory that he was dead because otherwise he would have come home. She even said she wanted whoever killed him to be convicted. This statement caused the investigators to become a bit curious about Kelly. Up until that point, nobody really suspected Kelly, but they did find her behavior to be a bit unusual, like she had no emotions, and when she did, the emotions appeared to be fake and over the top. The police soon discovered that Greg Owen had made threats against Doug. They wanted to find out more about Greg, so they asked Kelly. She said that after divorcing Doug, she was with Greg for a while, but it was over between them before she remarried Doug. Greg had made some threats against Doug during all of the drama. She eventually acknowledged that she had contacted Greg after she remarried Doug, but they were just talking. No sex was involved. She did, however, admit that she had a few sexual encounters with other men while she was with Doug. When the police finally found Greg, they called him in for an interview. Earlier in their discussion, they asked him if he knew Kelly had relationships with other men. Greg said he did not, and he appeared to be quite surprised. Doug's body was found 12 days after he was reported missing. Now the police knew they were dealing with homicide. In another interview on February 24, Greg confessed to the murder. He said he and Kelly entered into a conspiracy to murder Greg. After the police arrested Kelly the next day, she changed her story. Now she was saying that she found out Greg killed Doug only after it happened. She had no part in it. She didn't plan it with Greg. Greg threatened to kill her if she said anything to the police about his murderous behavior. Kelly and Greg were arrested and indicted on malice murder. They were offered a plea deal where they could spend the rest of their life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Greg took the deal, but Kelly decided to take her chances at trial. She believed that her behavior was not as serious as Greg's, and she didn't think that 25 years was a fair sentence. At her trial, Greg testified against her. He said that she approached him three months before the homicide and mentioned a way to get rid of her husband. She wanted the money from his life insurance and possession of his house. So money appeared to be a primary motivation for Kelly's crime. Evidence was also presented suggesting Kelly had threatened witnesses and attempted to conspire with the witness to commit perjury. Kelly was convicted of malice murder and would be sentenced to death. During her time in prison, she was considered a model prisoner by everyone she encountered without exception. Kelly's execution was delayed several times, once because of winter weather and once because prison officials discovered the drug that was going to be used in the execution was cloudy. I can picture one of those prison officials looking at the drug and saying, if we use this stuff, it could kill somebody. Eventually, the prison would have a safer lethal drug delivered. That's kind of a strange warning label to be on a drug. This drug is perfectly safe and lethal. Many people tried to intervene on Kelly's behalf to prevent her execution, but they were unsuccessful. Kelly Gissendainer was executed on September 30, 2015, at 12.21 a.m. Her last words were, Tell the Gissendainer family, I am sorry. That amazing man lost his life because of me. And if I could take it back, if this would change it, I would have done it a long time ago. But it's not. And I just hope they find peace, and I hope they find some happiness. God bless you. Now moving to my analysis. As far as mental health problems, experts testifying for the defense did not do Kelly any favors, mostly because their claims were difficult to support, and there was very little agreement between the clinicians. Let's take a look at some of the expert testimony. Kelly allegedly had a terrible history of repeated sexual abuse, there were no fewer than four separate perpetrators. Allegedly, her stepfather was one of them, as well as a friend's stepfather and two men in their 20s. The clinicians were forced to admit that this history was essentially just based on Kelly's statements. They had no good way of confirming or denying her account. One clinician used a Rorschach test and claimed that the results indicated that Kelly had brain damage. This is an inkblot test that's based on the theory of projection. 
So people look at this ambiguous ink blot and they project their own unconscious desires onto it. So what they see, what that ink blot looks like to them, has some type of special meaning. It's something that the person doesn't actually understand. The Rorschach test and many other projective tests have been thoroughly discredited even at the time of Kelly's trial. What little validity the Rorschach test does have has nothing to do with assessing brain damage. The instrument was never designed for that. Another clinician claimed that Kelly had post-traumatic stress disorder, cognitive disorder, dysthymic disorder, which is now known as persistent depressive disorder, and dependent, passive, and submissive personality traits. The clinician then drew the conclusion that Kelly could not have been the mastermind of the crime. I think the jury found this hard to believe, given the other evidence indicating that clearly Kelly was the mastermind. Overall, the clinicians exposed how lacking mental health assessments are. They unwittingly gave the jury a reason to disregard Kelly's potential mental health issues altogether. So this brings me to the question, did Kelly's mental health status mitigate her culpability, despite what the clinicians were saying and what they were unable to convince the jury of? Is it really true that Kelly's mental condition, her mental health, reduced her level of responsibility in this crime? I believe that Kelly did have a traumatic history. Many survivors of this type of trauma have difficulty finding corroboration for their accounts. Nobody wants to come forward and say anything. There's a few things that happen given this type of trauma that she allegedly experienced. One, relationships with men become highly unstable. Boundaries are crossed, disrespected, or never set in the first place. And two, development is interrupted. Again, people described Kelly as very immature. After trauma occurs, people get stuck, potentially, for several years in terms of their development. They stop maturing. So if somebody experiences a trauma at 17, they might really be 17 for many years after that. Not chronologically, of course, but in terms of their development. So when we see multiple traumas, that only slows things down even more. So if offenses occurred against her, say, when she was 7 and 8, then she would stop developing at that point. She might just start developing again when more traumas occurred. So again, growth stops. So really, when she turned 18 or 20 or 22, it's not clear how old she really was in terms of her emotions and her cognitions. Her development may have been severely impaired. I believe Kelly probably could not regulate her emotions in the context of a romantic relationship. She was always seeking more excitement in a relationship or seeking a new relationship that could bring that excitement. She was looking for the perfect love, the ideal romance. At the same time, she was greedy, selfish, lacked empathy, and was cold and callous. The jury was shocked at her lack of emotion throughout the entire trial. It was probably a major factor influencing their vote to execute her. All her personality factors came together so that she viewed Doug's life as worthless and became fixated on the financial benefits of killing him. I find it interesting that Kelly appeared as dependent, passive, or submissive. Perhaps this is how she appeared in prison, but inside of a romantic relationship, I imagine she was more forceful. This is consistent with borderline personality traits, which were never mentioned in this case, but some people believe may have actually been at work in this case. What about looking at this case from Doug's perspective? Were there any warning signs that could have prevented his death, like something he could have acted on but did not? Kelly was clearly harmful emotionally and physically. These are red flags that should not have been ignored. We know, for example, that Kelly attacked Doug during a counseling session with a chaplain. Usually attacking people in a therapy session is not considered an appropriate therapeutic technique. Doug's family repeatedly warned him to get away from her or not to go back with her, depending on the circumstances, like where they were in their relationship. Outside of the emotional and physical part, there was something else that really stood out about Kelly's behavior. She was financially abusive. Kelly was described as terrible with money by just about everybody who made observations about how she handled finances. Doug would work hard to put them in a good financial place, and Kelly would undo 
his effort, digging them right back into a hole. Doug made financial mistakes on Kelly's behalf, like when he took out a loan to buy her a 1986 Monte Carlo. He was paying 27% interest on that loan. Many of their fights were about Kelly's spending. She would repeatedly promise that she would change. She would respect their money. And he kept believing her. Ultimately, money would be a major part of her motive for homicide. Sometimes the type of behavior Kelly exhibited is referred to as financial narcissism. It often gets dismissed as a less harmful consequence of narcissism. But Kelly proved it can be deadly serious. Now moving to the last question. What about the death penalty in this case? I don't support the death penalty, but I can understand why many people do. Regardless of one's position on the death penalty, this case really didn't seem like a death penalty case. I think the reason the prosecution sought the death penalty in the first place is because life in prison without parole is only available in the state of Georgia if the prosecution attempts and fails to achieve a death sentence. I don't think they were really expecting the jury to vote for death. Rather, they wanted to ensure Kelly was never released from prison. I don't think the prosecution should have pursued the death penalty, if for no other reason, because the case against Kelly wasn't actually that good. I believe Kelly was guilty, and I believe she pressured Greg repeatedly into committing homicide. But several parts of Greg's story are just about impossible to believe. A few examples of the problems in his story. Greg admitted that he could have found a gun if he tried, but instead he traveled to Kelly's residence unarmed and was given a nightstick and knife by Kelly. Then, with only these two items, he convinces a physically larger and stronger man to get into his car and drive. Doug drove the pair past pedestrians, they passed other motor vehicles, they drove past businesses that were open. At no point did Doug slam on the brakes, ram the car into something, or otherwise just stop and jump out. When Doug did exit the vehicle in that remote location, after being ordered to by Greg, instead of running away, he complied with every command until he was killed. In addition to these problems, Greg was also trapped in multiple lies under cross-examination. During his appeal, Greg said that Kelly had nothing to do with the crime and there was another conspirator, which is a theory a lot of people believe. Again, Greg's story about Doug being submissive and allowing himself to be killed is just not believable. It just doesn't make any sense given the evidence that's available. Despite all the problems with the case, Kelly was of course convicted and executed. I think a statement she made right after the crime really hurt her. She said she wanted the person who killed Doug to be convicted and pay for their crimes. In a sense, Kelly's wish was granted. Those are my thoughts on the case of Kelly Gissendainer. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.